Father Ramon, how are you doing? I'm good, Alvaro. How are you? Good to see you. Oh, great to see you. And uh, tell me, are you a Columban? I'm a Columban, yeah. yeah. How do you meet For a long time uh, now. And how do you meet this uh, group? How did I meet the Columbans? Actually, my home in Ireland is a place called Drogheda, which is just 20 kilometers from the Columban House, Dalgan Park in Navan. And, um, but I never heard of the Columbans. Never heard of them growing up. Never saw the Far East. Nothing. I'm very unusual in Ireland. But, uh, but I was very interested in the Augustinians. I was an altar boy with the Augustinians in my hometown. And I was very impressed by them. I really liked them. And I thought, wow, that would be a, a good way to spend my life. So I was thinking of joining the Augustinians. But um, they invited me to go on an open, what they call an open vocations workshop, which was basically like a job sphere. Oh. All of the religious orders were there and the diocesan priests. And they were trying to sell themselves to young people who had come for the weekend. Mm -hmm. The Augustinians had invited me to try and attract Augustinians, young guys, to join the Augustinians. Because I had already kind of signed up for the Augustinians but hadn't gone to them yet. Um, and then I heard a Columban who was there. He gave a talk. And I remember it, because that's now, I, that's a long time ago now, but I still remember what he said. He said, if I'm going to be a priest and I'm going to give up having a family of my own and all that that relationship involves, then I'm going to go the whole way and be a missionary. And that just captured my imagination. I said to myself, I have to go the whole way as well. I have to be a missionary. And um, so I, instead of going on a, on a kind of organized workshop, I actually went to Navin one weekend. And I walked from Navin to Dalgan, which is quite a walk. And I just knocked on the door. And I said, one of the students opened the door. And I said, I'm here to see the Columbans. And he looked at me and said, what the? Huh? He said, there's no workshop on this weekend. And I said, I know, but I want to see the Columbans. So he invited me in. I had lunch. I stayed there for the weekend. They were a normal group of young guys uh, inspired by a desire to go on mission. And I felt very at home. And uh, the rest is history. I decided I had to say goodbye to the Augustinians and... I joined the Columbus. And what did they say? When, what did they, they say when you say thank you for all the promotion work, but I'm going to join the Columbans, those who go all the way? Actually, the Augustinians are a wonderful group and they were very supportive. You know, they didn't show any, they, they kind of really said, That's what God wants you to do. We wish you all the best and good luck. And also a, a diocesan priest. He was also very helpful. In uh, He very much supported me in my decision to explore a vocation with the, um, with the Columbans. Wow, that's a wonderful story. A missionary is the one who go all the ways, you know, take the, take the Jesus all I, the way. <laughs> I know, and all the diocesan, the, the diocesan, I felt kind of, they were looking at him going, what do you mean all the way? We're going all the way too. But anyway, he was very good at communicating. And for a young person, that kind of image of total commitment uh, is very attractive. And, so, and in this yeah. all the way, I understand you have been in several countries during these years as, as a priest. And where were yeah. you assigned? Um, I started off, uh, my first experience of ministry was, of course, in Ireland in a very working class parish in Ballymun. Great Beautiful people. place. I really loved it there. Beautiful place. Yeah I, was there for, yeah, I was there for a year, six months as a deacon, six months as a priest. And then I was appointed back to Taiwan, where I had done my SMA. Mm. And I was very happy with that. And I spent the next uh, almost 20 years in uh, Taiwan, working mostly with them. Um, uh, I had a local, small local parish and working with migrant uh, migrant workers. It happened a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Father Salustino, who also works in Taiwan. And he That's said right, he's there now. 
Yeah, he said the Chinese is uh, the Chinese language is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not wrong. Um, I started to learn um, Taiwanese. I'm sorry, the guys are working in the background here. They it's can't perfect. stop working. Don't worry. They don't have worry. To, um, um, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, yeah, I started. Um, I learned Taiwanese, which is the local uh, language in the area. Um, and it was it was difficult, like you know. I remember an old Marinol priest saying to me, he said to me one day that, "Hey, Father," he says, "Are you studying Taiwanese?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Let me tell you something. I'm here sixty years. This language was invented by the devil <laughs> to stop us communicating with the people." And um, I think he had a point. Yeah, Chinese language is uh, is difficult. Without a doubt. And after Taiwan, but, where do you go? Taiwan, where did I go? For... I, went, I went where you are, yeah. I went, um, I, uh, I was on the, uh, one of our general council from 2006 to 2012. And uh, we were in Ireland initially, but then we moved uh, the general council to uh, Hong Kong. So I, I was there for about four and a half years. Um, where you are, probably in your office, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. I am in the last one. I am in the last office. No, no, I, I wasn't. I wasn't in that one, no. Okay. And after they gave Hong me, Kong you got the best the, office. They gave me. And after Hong Kong and being in the general council? Uh, then I went back. I, I actually, um, I did a, a sabbatical for uh, six months. And I went uh, to the Oblitz in San Antonio in Texas um, and had a really good experience there. Actually, I was asked by the general council to go to Myanmar at that time um, before I went on that sabbatical. They were thinking of opening up again, coming back to Myanmar. And uh, I said yes. But on the sabbatical, I really had this kind of desire to spend some time in Ireland. I'd been more than 25 years away and I really felt a desire to reconnect with family. And uh, the image I had was I wanted to walk on my bare feet on the ground. Uh, and uh, so th they granted me that wish and they appointed me to Ireland for three years. I went to the parish in Ballymun that I had been in previously many, many years before. And I really, enjoyed being back there with that community mm -hmm. unfortunately i was the one to basically uh, we had to finish the columban involvement in that parish because um we didn't have anybody to come in after me so that was a kind of a painful process but also a good one because it was time and the columbans had been there for uh, 30 40 years i think and really had made a big impression mm -hmm. uh, it, but it was time to to move on and to uh, it, it was hand, it handed back to the diocese, yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful place. I, I had the opportunity to spend several uh, weekends uh, in Balimon during my yeah. time learning uh, English. Okay. Oh, that's why your English is so good. Well, the Balimon <laughs> English is another language. <laughs> they, uh, they're, but they're the salt of the earth. Wonderful people. I'm sure of that. And after Balimon, you close the church and... Move to? I did, no, I, I didn't close the church just to be safe. <laughs> the church is, <laughs> the you church just is still open. The There's just no Columban there. Yeah. Um, I, after Ballymun, I, I was appointed to uh, Myanmar, to um, what used to be called uh, Burma. Okay. And uh, what are you doing in Myanmar? Oh yeah, so I'm anyway, sorry. Years I mean, <laughs> putting all the effort learning Taiwanese, Chinese, and uh, then you say, tell me about it. I, talk to Myanmar, another country, another language. You are really yeah. following that word of that priest saying all the way. I just, I just got distracted because this truck is very noisy here behind me. Um, they went marketing. We had uh, so anyway. I came to Myanmar, um, but actually I was excited to come here. Um, it was a, a, a new mission, but actually it was a re-engagement with a mission that the Columbans had from 1936 until 1978. 
up in northeastern uh, Burma at that time um, called Kachin land with the Kachin people. Um, and the Columbans left uh, a wonderful legacy here of faith and commitment with this ethnic group. And they, they have a great memory and love for Columbus. They remember all of them uh, by name and celebrate them um, here. So I was very happy to come here and to, uh, to begin a, a Columban presence that was, is different from the one we had then. We're, we're here much more in the background as a supportive role to a growing um, young uh, church. Um, my interest when I came here um, was to work with in the area of addiction. Um, I had been coming here when I was on the general council. I had uh, I was the contact person with Myanmar, and I had come here every year uh, during that period. And I was aware of a growing problem of uh, drug addiction. Wow. Uh, but I finished my contact um, in uh, 2012. Uh, I was appointed back here and I arrived in 2017. And in that five years, the problem had literally exploded. Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that in this part of uh, Myanmar, every single family has one, two or three young people addicted to heroin. Um, it is like easily available here. But um, why is so common? Because heroin, it seems that is a drug that's yeah. not very common. Yeah, but well, th this part of northern, northeastern Myanmar, uh, Kachin State and Shan State, is the second biggest producer of heroin in the world after um, okay. Afghanistan. Okay. And it is the biggest producer of methamphetamines. So they're very easily available. You can, yeah. Heroin is cheaper than methamphetamine. It's very cheap here. So young people usually go for um, heroin. So wow. it's it's everywhere. Yeah. You can it, it, just where I am now, um, Alvaro. Sometimes when we drive out of here, going down the road, you will see two or three young people, not connected with our centre, but they just because we're in a, kind of an isolated road. They drive in there, you just see them on the road injecting heroin into their arms with needles. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very common. Yeah. Wow. So sad. So uh, that's... Yeah. Very, very hard, man. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, a, a rehabilitation center that was set up by the diocese here in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, they received some funding from the uh, Kachin organization and to, to help with drug addiction. Mm -hmm. So they built this center. It's in the Jinpo language, it's called uh, Pratnan, which means uh, rebirth or new life uh, rehabilitation center. Um, so they built it, they had, a, but they didn't really have much of an understanding of addiction, um, very little really. Uh, so they thought if you had a place for people and they came and they stopped that they would just leave and they would continue stop but of course addiction is a is a disease that doesn't really that's not the way it works so a Colombian sister sister Ashwina about uh, she was here for a while and she began to educate them about the nature of uh, of addiction I'm sorry about the noise it's fine um, that that show that you're the, in the right that show that you're in the real place. <laughs> so they um, she educated the staff about addiction, the nature of addiction, and uh, some treatment models. Um, when I came, I was particularly interested to introduce the uh, twelve step spirituality of Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, and that's basically at the heart of our program now. We are the only place in the whole of Myanmar that has uh, the 12-step spirituality. Um, it's the only place in the whole country? In the whole country. It had never reached here. Um, so I got material translated into uh, the Kachin language and also into the Burmese language. Um, mm -hmm. 
the basic material so that people can uh, follow at least the meetings and so yeah it's um slowly but surely uh, people are getting sobriety long term sobriety how many people are participated in that programs do they live there or they they yeah out? they live here we have we operate we run three programs um a year of 15 weeks um we encourage the people who come on a program from right from the beginning to consider coming back for aftercare uh because one program really you're just scratching the surface um so usually we we, we can accommodate now uh, uh 60 participants uh, we have two dormitories one is for 20 or yes for 20 uh, they're, they're aftercare and we have a dormitory for 40 who are first time flying and we've discovered that about 50% now of the clients come back for aftercare and so they're the ones you can really work with uh, to deepen their sobriety and hopefully uh, some of them but uh, alvaro addiction is an insidious disease it is um, the 12 step spirituality program calls it cunning and baffling and it really it's a mental physical and spiritual disease and when you put those three together it's tough to uh to break but, the but guys are getting recovery you know if they follow the program they will they will get recovery you know okay. we just say one day at a time we don't say to people you must stay sober for the rest of your life because they'll run out the door who wants to stay sober for the rest so it's that's very frightening we just say no you just stay sober today and then tomorrow is another day you know and you gradually you build up a lot of days and, and you realize oh i'm kind of this is uh, this is working for me wow. and, and yeah so it may yeah. i ask you something uh Eamon, because you're saying you have 40 people three times a year maybe 60 people uh yeah and i'm sure you had the only center in the whole country but who pay for it because it's uh it yeah it's costly, uh, right? We, we ask a contribution from the clients, uh, but it's a small contribution. Um, it certainly doesn't cover what goes on here. Um, we, um, and we don't refuse anybody who can't pay. If somebody comes here and wants to recover, we will accept them. If their families can give the small contribution we ask for, uh, then that's great. The diocese, because of this is such a problem, in the diocese, the, uh, the bishop has mandated that one Sunday every month, there is to be a collection for the work of uh, combating drug addiction. Um, we get some of that money. Some of it goes to other programs um, that the diocese has. Like they have an office for, for drug addiction. And um, so, there are staff, so they have to pay. So, but they give some of that money to us uh, each month. Um, but the rest, uh, we, I just basically have to fundraise for, you know, try and, uh, and I, God has been very good. Um, we have never wanted for food, you know, um, we have, uh, part of our food budget is covered by Trokera in Ireland, who, um, came to visit us and, uh, by accident really. And they didn't know that there was this existed. They work in Kitchen State, but they didn't know that this existed, this place. And they were very anxious to try and help us in some way. So they give us a supplement for our food budget each year, which literally, literally was a lifesaver. Um, yeah. uh, so, we're, yeah. And then other people, individual donors, um, have been very generous uh, to the center. And it meant we can keep going because we have to, you know, we have staff, we have salaries for the staff. Um, yeah, because uh, we have. What, how many people work there? I mean, it's for to to help these <laughs> yeah, people to 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 move on with their life and, and and be sober. The way we work it is, we have a a, a staff of seven or eight, and they are full time staff. Then we have what we call volunteer staff. Mm -hmm. These are people who have finish the program, um, have volunteered once to help, and then volunteered a second time. And so then we consider them volunteer staff, and we give them a stipend for their personal needs. Um, uh, 
so that's very so we have all together now we have 20 <laughs> which is a big group um, and actually during the during this lockdown um, we have 25 people have stayed here um, and we are all still friends would you believe you know if uh, nobody nobody has killed anybody <laughs> I've tried I, I've tried a couple of times, but they calm me down. <laughs> no, no, no. It, we, 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 we've literally been here for four months. Um, we, we're going out for food. Uh, we, we, we try to occupy ourselves each day. We have a program. We have different... We guys share their different gifts with each other. And um, it's been actually a very good experience. And this group now, some of them are actually clients, and some are aftercare, the people who stayed. Because at the end of the last program, we had to finish early because all the transport was stopping. But I told people they could stay, that I would stay with them, and some of the staff would stay with them if they felt they couldn't go home. And about 20 of them felt they couldn't go home. So um, for various reasons, uh, some had come from very poor backgrounds. There's no income in Myanmar now for most people, really. It's a very bad situation. This is because the, the, the COVID-19... Yes, they cannot work. Like the work has been, uh, you know, the, m most people are subsistence farming, so they have food. But like uh, anybody who was working in an, in, a, in an office or in some, that was all closed. It's beginning to open up now, but it was closed for three months. And so they had no income. Because um, there's no, it's not like other countries where, you know, the government steps in and gives money to people who are not. No, you don't work here, you don't eat. Um, there's no kind of subsidies from anybody. Um, so they stay. So this group has been together now for four months. We were hoping to accept new clients um, last week, but the government have extended the restrictions until the end of July. And will they? I don't know whether they will lift them then or not. Nobody knows. But we're ready to accept new clients now. The other thing, Alvaro, is that one of the hidden addict things here is addiction among women um, on, among men it's it's unacceptable socially unacceptable but among women it's doubly socially unacceptable but many women are using and there is no facility anywhere in the country for women to to get recovery in Michina there are 44 rehab centers run by different organizations different churches different places most of them don't know anything about addiction um, and are, I mean, their methods, let's say, are not great. Um, but there's nowhere for women. So at the moment, I have been uh, fundraising, I am fundraising for, we're planning to build a women's dormitory just outside this compound, but with a door into it, so that the women can come and attend our program and get recovery as well. Because all of these guys, they, they and, use and that, heroin. And that dormitory, uh, or your dream about this new building for them and offer them the possibility of uh, recovery. Yes. How much money we're talking yeah. about? Because it's, it's hard for, for me that I live in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, how much is the cost we're of talk life? Yeah. We're, uh, I, we're talking about um, all together for the building about. 70,000 US dollars. Wow. Um, this would be uh, because you, have, you can't just build a dome, you have to build a, a, something around it because it has to be a safe space, especially for women. Um, we, we have a dormitory for them inside. We will have a room for a staff member to stay there. There will be the uh, shower and toilet area. And then we are building a, a classroom outside for classes that will be specific to women's issues. Okay. So the, usually they will join the, the general program, but they will have, there will be times when they will just have their own uh, program, their own classes, and uh, maybe their own 12-step meetings among women. Women mm -hmm. maybe want to talk about women's issues among themselves, not with men. So, um, yeah, so that, it'll be about, yeah, um, 70, and then there's, um, there's, uh, then we have to, you know, then we have to run it. You know, we'll have to get some new staff in, and uh, I think. Um, but I firmly believe that this is 
a, a great need here. I believe it's, I really believe that it's God's plan. And so I have, I have confidence that somehow this will happen, you know. Well, we, we wish you all the best. I know what you're doing there from, from hearing what you're sharing with us. It's, it's amazing work and, and a tremendous opportunity for many people to find a new life. And if we can provide that, um, I think it's, a, it's something that we must do for them mm. and with them. And uh, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's very true. Um, they, I get great life from these young men here who are very brave to come here and who are really trying to change their life. And they come from very difficult backgrounds. You know, they, most of them come from poor families. Um, some of them have been traumatized by the war. This is the, in this part of Myanmar, the, the war between the Kachin Independence Army and the Burmese military is the longest going civil conflict in the world. It has been going on for over 60 years. And because of that, there has been no development here. Um, this is a very rich state, but all of the stuff is taken out and other people get rich, but the local people, they remain poor. It's, um... So it's, yeah, it's, um, but they're very resilient people, very extraordinarily generous people, really, really generous. I mean, they're poor, but from their poverty, they give, like, you know, um, so, so impressed by them. I'm sure of that. And, and Emun, when, who you remember the phrase that impact you when you joined the Columban from that priest, you know, going all the way? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I have, uh, I have tried my best. Um, uh, but, you know, people say, oh, you, honestly, Alvaro, I, I, I've never been happier in my missionary life than I am here. Um, it's, uh, I, I was very happy in Taiwan, um, but for some reason, I'm just, I'm, I'm, maybe it's my age, as you get older, you uh, a little bit wiser and a little bit, so I'm not as manic as I used to be in terms of wanting to do things, but I'm very comfortable just being with these people, and um, so if that's going the whole way, then I'm trying to go the, the whole way. Um, uh, but, you know, I think everybody who's trying to follow Jesus is trying to go the whole way, whatever situation they find themselves in. I'm lucky. I have found a place where I'm happy. And uh, that's a great, great blessing, you know. It's, it's, um... Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's easy. Um, there are difficulties. But overall, I am blessed to be here. Of course, language. I'm afraid... I'm, I'll be 60 in a, next month, actually, and um, just learning language at this age is torture, you know. I, my brain, it does, I don't know why it doesn't work like it did when it's I was getting harder. before. What's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's getting harder, I don't know. And then I realize, I look at myself, I look at a picture of myself at 24, and I look at a picture of myself at this age, and I see, oh, my body has changed too, so my brain is no different. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's true. Both things work together. Emon, yeah. you know, we, we have been talking for a long time and, and, and the program needs oh. to go. So Sorry, okay. it's a pity because I would like to keep knowing and, 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 and getting more information from you. What you thank you, Th thanks Alvaro, thank you. People and, um, yeah. thank, thank you to all the Colombians and all the Columbus supporters who make our work possible. We are only here because of them, you know, um, or because of you. There's no way uh, we could be here if we didn't have people behind us, supporting us with prayers and financially. So thank you. If anybody's watching this and you're a Columbus supporter, thank you. No, thank you really much, uh, very much because really you, you are impacting so many people's life and, uh, and maybe it's a drop in the ocean, but without drop, Without that drop, the ocean will be completed. So thank you for your service, for your priesthood, and for the, all the good work that you are doing there. So, well, I just had the time to say goodbye and enjoy Myanmar, and let us meet in Myanmar sometimes in the future. I hope so. Thanks, Alvaro.